Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today, we're starting a brand new series entitled, What Manner of Man Is This? And this message today will be entitled, Master of the Storm. Turn with me, please, to our scripture reading, which is found in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 through 27. And when he had entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much that the ship was covered with waves. But he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the man marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now the very first thing that I would like us to, to notice, to look on, to focus on, is the disciples' reaction to the miracle they just had witnessed. Verse 27, But the man marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? They marveled, meaning that they were surprised. They were astonished. They couldn't even believe their eyes. They couldn't believe what they were actually seeing with their own eyes. They had woke him up. Jesus was asleep, but they woke him up to do something. Maybe to help them bail. I don't know, but they, they wanted him to do something. And when he gets up, and he, he, he does something about it, they couldn't believe what they saw. They couldn't believe that he actually calmed the wind and the waves. I don't know what they were expecting, but it didn't sound like they were expecting that. So am I talking to somebody today? See, maybe you're praying about something and then the Lord answers. Maybe not in the way that you're expecting. So you, you can't believe that it's actually happening. You can't believe that it's coming to, co coming to pass. So, so you get so caught up in that, that you even begin to reject it. Maybe you think that you're not worthy of it. Maybe you think that, that something happened. But here, here's the thing. If the Lord has blessed you with an answered prayer, you accept it. You say, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you for your provision. So stop looking with your natural eyes and start to look with your spiritual eyes. Don't be like Thomas who saw all the miracles that Jesus performed. He saw the blind eyes open. He saw the lame get up and begin to walk about. He saw leprosy healed. He saw all sorts of sicknesses just cured instantly. He saw demons and evil spirits come screaming out of people as Jesus rebuked them and cast them out. He even saw the dead raised to life again. But then he saw Jesus beaten, bruised as he were, nailed to a rugged cross, nailed to the tree. He saw him die. He saw him buried. And so when it came to resurrection time and Jesus was resurrected back to life, he refused to believe. He said unless he could put his finger in his hands and thrust his hand in his side, he will not believe. Not that he could, he will not believe. He refused to believe. We are not sure whether all of the disciples were in the boat at that time, when this miracle took place. We don't know if Thomas was there or not, or if it was just the earliest called disciples. Matthew chapter nine, verse nine, seems to suggest that Matthew, for one, the Ma Matthew the tax collector, was not there. And probably Thomas was not there either. So if we take a look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, it says, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. 
So again, it seems to suggest that Matthew was not there, that Matthew was not an eyewitness to that miracle. Yet all of the Gospels, all of the Synoptic Gospels, record that story. But I want us to look again at the reaction of those disciples who was there, who were there, all those disciples. 27, verse 27. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now, the disciples who were in the boat with Jesus when he performed that miracle were supposed to be already convinced that he was the Messiah. I want us to look at two chapters or two passages of scripture. Turn with me first to John chapter 1 and we're going to read two, two, three verses, 40, 41, and 42. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. See, Andrew was convinced that he had found the, the Messiah. So he went and got, got his brother Peter and he brought him, saying, Look, I, I believe that we found the Messiah. Look at John chapter 1, verse 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I said to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Nathanael was the first one to proclaim that Jesus was the Son of God. There is very little doubt that he was one of the disciples in the boat that day. Yet, he, ex he exclaimed, What manner of man is this? It wasn't a question as so much as it was a declaration, I believe. What manner of man is this? See, sometimes we are in that same boat. Life's fierce winds are howling all around us and it's blowing over 100 miles an hour. The, 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 the waves of the keels of this life are crashing against our ship and breaking over our bow. It's threatening to sink us. The lightning is flashing across the sky. It's lighting up the night sky so bright, so fearful, and the thundering sound of thunder just crashes all around us, and the ship is filling up with water faster than we can bail it out. Of course, we are saved. Of course, we are serving Jesus. Of course, we know that he is our all sufficiency. Of course, we depend on him. Of course, we know he's all powerful. Of course, we know he can do all things because he's God Almighty. Of course, we know this, we believe it, we know the scriptures, we can quote them. We know that head faith. We know it in our head. What we don't have is the faith of a mustard seed. We must get it from our head to our hearts. We can confess it with the mouth, but until we confess it in our hearts, there is no true faith. 
The thing is, though, when life storms begin to rage and our boat threatens to sink and there is no land in sight but only darkness all around us, it is not that easy to put down the bailing pan. It's not that easy just to, 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 to cast all of our cares upon Jesus. It's not that easy just to cast all of our, our, our worries, all of our fears on Jesus. It is not that easy. It's just not. In times like this, we forget that Jesus is all sufficient. We, we forget that he's almighty God because we are looking with our natural eyes. So with our natural eyes, we feel like we need to take control of the situation ourselves instead of casting our cares and our burdens upon him because he care for us. So I ask you, were the disciples not yet fully convinced that Jesus was the Messiah? Did they just believe that he was only a great prophet and so they followed him? Or were they just toying with the idea of him being the promised one? No, I don't believe that. I believe that they were convinced. We went over that. We proved that with the scriptures we read. I want you to look at one more scripture with me. This is John the Baptist's own testimony. John chapter 1 verse 29 through 34. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is John the Baptist speaking. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him. He who sent me to baptize with water said to me, On whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I, I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. There is very little doubt, if any, that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that these disciples believed that. So what was the reason for the question? What manner of man is this? Could it be that they believed with their heads, but not with their hearts? Although they knew the word spoken of him, Although they connected it back to Moses' writing and to the prophets, although the miracles that Jesus, uh, uh, that Jesus performed confirmed it, yet it hadn't seemed to gotten into their spirits that this was indeed God incarnate. Aren't we that same way? Don't we act that way sometimes? This is what we say. Well, I did everything I know to do. I guess the only thing I can do now is pray. Well, that is not the way that it should be. Prayer or seeking Jesus is not our last resort. It is not the thing that we do after we've done everything else and everything else has failed. No, prayer is what we do first. Our attitude should be, let me take it to the Lord in prayer. First. But instead, we wrestle with things that we could give over to the Lord, that we should give over to the Lord. We stay awake all night worrying about things that we cannot control, that we cannot change, things that will never happen, things that will never come to pass. There are studies that show that Anywhere between 85 and 91% of what we worry about never, ever comes to pass. I even saw a post where it basically said something like this. Worrying works because 90% of what we worry about never happens. We believe that God can do all things, but how? 
How can we believe that if we don't put our, our faith into action? Sometimes we, we, we fancy that he might not do it for us. He can do all things, yes. He can do it for others. But will he do it for me? I want us to, to, to look at the faith of, of the centurion. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't even a follower of Jesus. Yet he put his hope completely, fully into Jesus. His servant was sick. He had heard all about Jesus. He had heard all about the mighty acts of healing. He heard about the, the lame walking, the blind seeing. He even heard about the dead being raised. He heard it. He heard the stories. So he himself went to see Jesus. He didn't send someone else. Many Christians won't pray for themselves. Even more Christians won't pray at all. They would rather someone else labor in prayer on their behalf. Now, I'm in no way discounted asking for prayer. Please, pray for me. If you can do anything, please, remember me in your prayers. Remember me that the Lord would open up doors, would open up opportunities for us. But that does not release me from praying for myself. Paul, the mighty Paul, the, the great apostle, he prayed for himself. So the centurion did not rely on someone else to do what he knew he ought to do himself. He wanted his servant healed and he believed. No, he knew that Jesus could do it and he knew that he would do it if he would only ask. So he himself went to ask. So, are your children serving the Lord? If they aren't, ask Jesus. Are your children in unhealthy relationships? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are your children wandering, strung out on drugs? Are they away from the Lord? Again, take it to the Lord in prayer. Is someone that you love, someone that you know, needs healing? Are they sick in body? The prayer of the faith will heal the sick. Are you called to do something? And if you're called to do something, you need to be sure that it's the, the Lord that's calling you and not the enemy trying to distract you. So when that happens, get a confirmation from someone you know, someone that you trust, and then pray and ask for open doors. But get a confirmation. The Lord will always confirm what he, he's telling you. Remember this. Not every opportunity is from the Lord. Not every open door the Lord wants you to walk through. So... The centurion goes to see Jesus and he explains to him, his servant is ill. His servant needs a healing. And Jesus says, sure, I will come with you and I will heal him. But now I want you to look at the centurion's reply. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. The centurion was like, you don't even need to come. Look, I, I understand authority, because I am a man who is under authority also. I have great authority. I can say to someone, go, let someone else come, and, and they do it. So I understand authority, and I understand that you have great authority. I've heard his stories. I know. I believe. And so he says, besides all of that, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. You are a holy man. Matter of fact, I believe that you are the Son of God. Because no one can do these miracles, these great miracles that you do without God's help. So I believe. 
and I know I'm not worthy. So just say the word and my servant will be healed. That pretty much floored Jesus. He was stunned when he heard this. Look at Jesus' reply in Matthew chapter 8, verse 10. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Listen to that statement. No one in Israel. Well, that is the truth. Not even his disciples had that kind of faith. Because just a few verses later, their faith would be tested and this would be their reaction or their reply. What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? When we come to Jesus, we need more than just head knowledge. Just a belief in the head. We need to, to have a real good down-to-earth belief in who he is and what he can do. It is called the unshakable faith. Nothing can change our mind. No doubt, no worry. Not even doubt around us from others. No amount of discouragement. Not even our present situation. The facts won't change our mind. It is not about what we see. It's about what we believe. There's a chorus we used to sing in church years ago. It says, whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. Whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. And that's where we need to be. That is where we need to camp out. I will believe the report of the Lord, the Lord. No matter what report is given to us, we will believe the report of the Lord. By his stripes, we are healed. We believe it. The Lord shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. We believe it. We can have whatever we ask the Father in the name of the Son. We believe it. Because Jesus said it. Therefore, we believe. No matter what our natural eyes see, we will take a second look with our spiritual eyes and we will believe the report of the Lord. God is greater than all of our trouble. God is greater than all of our needs. And he gives us good, good desires. I want us to try using our spiritual eyes this week. I want us to exercise our faith this week. Why? Because 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And again in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And that's where we need to be. We need to walk by faith. We need to take our eyes off of what we see and put our eyes on Jesus. We need to take our eyes off of the mountain and look at the mountain mover. For God is greater than all of our storms. He is greater than all of our troubles. God can do all Things. There's nothing too great or nothing too small for our God to do. And we will pick this up again, not next week, but the following week. Because faith, Romans chapter 10 verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the more you hear, the more your faith will be built up. It's like the woman with the issue of blood that we speak about. If I could only but touch the hem of his garment. See, she was building up her faith. If I can only touch the hem of his garment. And what she believed, according to her faith, it was done. You know, just the other day, my, my wife Celia said to me, did you notice that everyone who came to Jesus, it was done to them according to their faith. 
And you know, she's right. When the centurion said, all you got to do is to speak it. You don't have to come. And he did. He spoke it. Let it be according to, to your faith. That the, the Jairus' daughter, he said, come. Come to my house. So that was his measure of faith. So he went with Jairus to his house. The woman with the issue of blood, she, she, she didn't need to hear nothing. She didn't need Jesus to, to, to lay his hands on her. She didn't need any of that. It was her faith that reached out and touched the hem of his garment. And she got her healing because her faith was strong. It was done to her according to her faith. So whatever measure of faith that we have, whatever measure of faith that God has given us, let us act on that measure of faith. Because it does, you don't need some huge mountain of faith to move a mustard seed. You need a mustard seed of faith to move a mountain. Turn it around. Get it in perspective. Our God is a great, great God. So the centurion heard all about Jesus. And he believed. And so he got his request. He got his miracle. His servant was healed. What about you? You have heard. Do you believe? Do you want miracles in your life? Do you know Jesus is Lord and Savior? Jesus is coming back real soon. Are you ready? Would you like to be ready? If you would... Say this prayer. Just ask Jesus for forgiveness. Ask him to come into your life. And he will. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice, opens the door, I will come into him. And I will sup with him and he with me. Jesus wants to have fellowship with you. All you got to do is to invite him in. He's not going to barge in. He, he needs an invitation. So... If you would like to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, say this simple prayer of repentance with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to have the faith of a mustard seed. Help me not just to believe in my head, but to believe with my heart. That it might be all in my soul, from the very pit of my stomach, the belief boils up and rises up and overflows in me. That when the Son of Man returns, He will find me with faith. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for saving me. I accept it now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is get a Bible, highlight, read, read, highlight, learn those scriptures, confess those scriptures. Find a Bible believing church who believes in righteousness and holiness. Do not join a, a, a one of those progressive churches that believe that you can live anyway because God loves everyone and everyone will be saved. It's only those who call upon the name of the Lord that will be saved. Go and sin no more. I want to say thank you so, so much for joining us every week. We appreciate you so much. And those who go onto our website and, and, and look at our videos and check out uh, all of our other things that we have on, on, on our website, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.